In this video, we will explore the ways that the West really had an impact on the history of Japan in the 19th century. Uh, and in the case of Japan, it was not Great Britain, but rather it was the United States that forced Japan to open from its Tokugawa era seclusion. And this was, of course, uh, the American Commodore Perry, who sailed into Edo Bay with his famous black ships and basically said to the Tokugawa, we want a treaty, and if you don't give us one, watch out. And uh, Tokugawa Japan had seen what had happened to China in the Opium War, the first Opium War and realized that they had no match for American naval might, just like the British had no match, or the Qing had no match for British naval might. And so the Tokugawa agreed. And so the first treaty was essentially one, uh, it was called the Wooden Water Treaty by some. Uh, it was essentially a guarantee that American ships could actually land in uh, Japanese port cities and get the supplies they need. And it was up to another American diplomat, Townsend Harris, to negotiate a broader diplomatic and commercial treaty, much like the Treaty of Nanking was negotiated in China. Uh, he negotiated the first uh, broad treaty between the United States and Japan. And then other nations like Britain and France and other Western powers followed in the years to follow. Not everyone in Japan took this uh, lightly. And in fact, there was a significant movement uh, that was known by its slogan, Sono Joi, revere the emperor and expel the barbarians. Uh, and they were very angry with the Tokugawa shogunate for even having any kind of relations with these strangers and sought to use Japanese power to expel them. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this didn't expel the barbarians, but what it did do is lead to the overthrow of the Tokugawa shogunate. Uh, because in 1868, you have what is known as the Meiji Restoration. Uh, this is the moment when the house of Tokugawa, uh, who had ruled Japan in fact, as shoguns from Tokugawa Ieyasu back in 1600 or so, uh, they are eliminated and no longer allowed to have power. And so in theory, the emperor is restored to power, hence the name Meiji Restoration, Meiji being the, the reign period of this particular emperor and he being restored to power. Uh, in practice, this was not the case. Uh, but the Meiji government adopted a goal which was, in order to expel the barbarians, we need to learn what makes them powerful. And we need to imitate that. And so our goal is to create a prosperous nation with a powerful military, Fukoku Kyohei. And once we do that, we can ensure that the barbarians can't humiliate us like they're doing to the Chinese. And the people making these decisions were a group of oligarchs known as the Genro. Uh, led by people like this gentleman, Ito Hirobumi, and others. And so while, again, it's called the Meiji Restoration, and it implies that the emperor is making all these decisions, he remained a figurehead. He did not make any critical decisions, but rather people like Ito did. And what did they do? Well, they said, we need to learn how these Westerners got to be so powerful. And so they sent a number of delegations abroad to observe various institutions and practices found in North America and in Europe. The most famous of these was the Iwakura mission that was sent in the 1870s. Uh, here's Iwakura and some of his uh, fellow travelers. They traveled to the United States. They traveled to many European countries. They observed railroads. They observed uh, military installations. They observed factories. They observed schools. They observed post offices. And they took copious notes on everything. Here's how the Americans do it. Here's how the British do it. Here's how the French do it, and so on. And then they came back to Japan with their recommendations for what Japan should do in order to become a prosperous nation with a powerful military. Uh, in addition, the Meiji government uh, hired a significant number of foreigners to come help them uh, modernize and westernize. 3,000 foreigners were hired directly by the government another 2,300 by private organizations. Uh, and, and so learning directly from foreigners how the foreigners got to be powerful and how to set up a modern military and a modern industrial sector and, and a modern educational system and so on. They also engaged in wholesale social reform. They basically said to the samurai, the top class in the Tokugawa period, you're fired. All of your traditional hereditary prerogatives are now done away with. Go out and find a job. Uh, many samurai 
did just that and became some of the leading businessmen in the new Japan, but others fade from the pages of history because they weren't able to make that transition. The Meiji state also engaged in widespread tax reform in order to get enough revenue to pay for all these modernizing projects. And this meant essentially taxing the peasants even more than before. They saw that an industrial economy was a critically important element of Western success. And so sought to create factories and uh, banks and other aspects of, it, of a capitalist industrial economy. They clearly saw the need for a modern military with uh, modern weaponry and modern organization and modern tactics. And they also saw that many Western powers seem to have this document that, that uh, established the rules for the state, a constitution. And so in the case of the Meiji uh, in 1890, the Meiji constitution was drafted and enacted. And in some respects, this looks like uh, the U.S. Constitution or other ones that, that guarantee certain freedoms for its citizens, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and so on. Uh, except in almost every case, uh, the clause that outlines the freedoms or rights that uh, Japanese citizens should enjoy under the Meiji Constitution always had this limiting clause afterwards, except when limited by law. Uh, which allowed uh, for when the Japanese government turned much more authoritarian for them to abridge all of these rights that supposedly the Constitution granted. The Meiji uh, oligarchs recognized that mass public education was uh, an important part of the Western success. And so they built schools and uh, had a goal that all Japanese children would go to them. And among other things, they observed uh, in Prussia this new institution called Kindergarten, that, uh, that educated very young children and said, we want that too. And uh, among other things, they uh, saw a Prussian reformer by the name of Friedrich Froebel, uh, who in Prussian kindergartens, among other things, uh, trained young five-year-old kids to improve their motor skills by folding paper into different shapes. And so they brought back this idea from Germany and they said, hey, uh, some Buddhist monks in a couple of our monasteries uh, fold these really nice, interesting shapes. Uh, why don't we have all of our kindergarten kids do this? And thus, origami becomes a widespread Japanese cultural practice. It existed in Japan before the Meiji era, but it becomes widespread because it's taught in literally every kindergarten because of what Meiji uh, reformers observed in Prussia. Not everyone liked the pace and scope of these reforms. Uh, and one of the leaders of the last attempt to sort of support the old ways of doing things is this gentleman, Saigo Takamori. He led a rebellion called the Satsuma Rebellion in 1877. Uh, and that even though he initially was one, one of the, the chief advocates of these kind of reforms, he ultimately decided it went too far. It took away the privileges of the samurai. It was eroding the Japanese national character. And so he got a group of like-minded uh, people, and they raised the Santa of Rebellion uh, and sought to overthrow the Meiji. Uh, the oligarchs had better armies with better equipment, and they uh, destroyed and suppressed the Satsuma Rebellion. Uh, for those that are interested, uh, the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai, uh, is inspired in some broad sense by these events and the Ken Watanabe figure in this is, is based very loosely on Saigo Takamori. Uh, I would note that Japanese historians have concluded that basically if there is a historical fact uh, to get wrong, the last samurai managed to do it. Uh, the, the, the very little of what you see here is, is very historically accurate. Uh, not least the fact is why do you need a, a white Tom Cruise figure in the story at all? It's a Japanese story. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, the, this is sort of a, a popular cultural uh, manifestation of this particular moment. A huge part of the major reforms was economic, uh, the need to develop a strong industrial sector. And unlike the Anglo-American model, which is laissez-faire, hands-off, you know, let individual businesses form, let individual consumers make their self-interested decisions, in the Meiji state, uh, the government was heavily involved, especially in the early stages of industrialization. And in this, it is following the, the, uh, the lead of Prussia, Germany, uh, which also had heavy state involvement. Uh, and one early Japanese innovation that was very, very influential was a financial group or clique called the Zaibatsu. This was essentially uh, one powerful family that had a central holding company uh, 
but then when you get involved in all sorts of different enterprises, sometimes uh, vertically related to the resource extraction and production and distribution of a particular good, but in many cases horizontally connected in, in very different fields. So a, a zaibatsu that is initially was involved in, say, construction might also get involved in insurance and finance and so on. Some of the key early examples of zaibatsu are names that we still recognize today in, in the Japanese financial sector, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, and so on. Uh, and, and very clearly, the, you know, the House of Mitsui, as, as is depicted here, uh, was saying we, we have to do this kind of organization because that's what the Westerners do, that what's, that's what makes them prosperous and powerful, we need to follow it. Uh, the stages of Japanese industrialization are uh, fairly familiar to those that uh, follow the, these stages in many other parts of the world. You start with the strategy of import substitution. This means that you try to produce for the domestic market rather than buying things from abroad. And remember, the Japanese domestic market was pretty big because of the Tokugawa era of population growth and the heavy, uh, significant levels of urbanization. But it's usually not enough to base your entire economy on just the domestic one. And so you shift to producing things to sell to other countries and other people, export-oriented growth. In this, you focus first on enterprises that are fairly labor-intensive, uh, things like cotton textiles. That's, of course, what Britain started with in its industrialization. And uh, you want to take advantage of cheap labor costs. And what, what are the cheapest workers in Japan? Women. And, and so a lot of these labor-intensive en enterprises employed a large number of women, especially in the early stages. But then you shift to heavy industry because you want to make big-ticket things like steel and ships and railroad machinery and so on. Uh, and, and Meiji Japan did this very successfully and very quickly and rapidly became the most prosperous and powerful economy in East Asia. But it's not enough to just adopt Western-style schools and military organization and economic uh, structure. Another thing that Japanese reformers and leaders realized they needed to do to become more like the West was do what the West was doing in conquering neighboring peoples, become an empire. And this process begins actually with some areas that we now characterize as the Japanese home islands. First, the northern island of Hokkaido. Uh, during the Tokugawa, Hokkaido was only loosely controlled by the Tokugawa, and there weren't very many non-Ainu Japanese who lived there. Uh, but Meiji Japan recognized that if Japan didn't control this island, a, another power, probably Russia, would, and that would be detrimental to Japan's interests. And so Japan, Meiji Japan sought to solidify its control over this island. And in doing so, they uh, adopted the advice of a Western advisor, one of those 3,000 people hired by the Meiji government, a French-born American by the name of Charles Legendre. And uh, he recognized that the really important feature of establishing Japanese control over Hokkaido was boots on the ground, people living there, that that's the best way to maintain the claim. But he worried that because Hokkaido was so far away from the major population centers, it was so far north and cold, that many Japanese wouldn't want to go there. And so he made a very intriguing suggestion to the Meiji government. Why don't you write to uh, this group in the United States, the Mormons, and invite them to come colonize Hokkaido on, part, on behalf of Japan? Uh, he thought that the Mormons uh, had proven that they could exist in inhospitable terrain like Utah, and that they were good law-abiding folk, and so they would uh, cooperate with the Japanese and become the, the forerunners of Japanese colonization. Uh, the Meiji oligarchs weren't very uh, in, entranced by this uh, proposition, and they rejected it. But nonetheless, they encouraged Japanese settlement of Hokkaido, and ultimately this was so successful that no one disputes Japan's ownership of this island today. Uh, similar uh, measures were taken in the Kuril Islands, which uh, were then called Chishima in, 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 in Japan which obviously to this day are, are, are now disputed with Russia, but also down south, the Ryukyu Islands, uh, which are now known as Okinawa, uh, only loosely under Tokugawa control, but Meiji claims it and solidifies its hold on these islands. So again, the first fruits of Japanese imperial expansion were in the north in Hokkaido and the Kirils, and in the south, Okinawa. And for the most part, with the exception of the Kirils, these efforts have been so successful that no one thinks anything other than these are Japanese islands. This is Japanese territory. 
much in the way that very, very few people dispute uh, Ohio being part of the United States, even though it too was a colonial possession and a product of American imperial expansion. Now, some efforts at expansion and settlement become so successful that uh, they become integral parts of the larger nation. And this is true of Ryukyu and Hokkaido and Ohio and a bunch of other places in the U.S. So all told, this modernization was really rapid and very impressive in the minds of many Japanese and many outside observers. Within years, Japan was building its own steamships. It was building its own railroads and had more lines and miles of railroad track than any other uh, country in Asia, including China. It was building telegraphs and, and uh, communicating with uh, much more speed and effectiveness than before. Uh, and all these things were, were remarkable in their speed and their scope and their success. Um, you should note that I'm using uh, uh, traditional Japanese woodblock prints to illustrate these. These were very popular in, in Meiji Japan uh, and also became very, very popular for many Westerners that were interacting with Japan uh, who really liked the style of these and, and like the scenes that they depicted. And uh, these kinds of things become intimately intertwined with some really interesting and significant Western artistic movements, not least of which is Impressionism. And so, for example, look at this woodblock print of Mount Fuji and, and note the trees in the foreground, and then compare that to this uh, well-known Claude Monet painting, which is clearly influenced based on uh, the, the Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, Monet himself was so entranced with this that uh, he, he dressed up his wife in supposed Japanese garb and painted her. Uh, you know, very clearly uh, a lot of things that we think are independent, authentic uh, traditions in both East and West uh, owe much to the interactions between the two of them. Uh, here's a Japanese silk reeling faculty, uh, factory, excuse me. And note all of the women working here. Uh, employing women is, is, is uh, the most uh, cost-effective way to minimize your labor costs, and, and a great number of them uh, were the foundation of the Japanese industrial expanse. As the Japanese empire expanded, it hit up against other empires in the region, most significantly China. Uh, and in 1894, 1895, uh, Japan embarks on the first Sino-Japanese war, Japan being smaller and having less population, uh, many people expected Japan to lose this conflict. But on both land, fought mostly on the Korean Peninsula, and on sea, fought mostly in the Yellow Sea, uh, Japan wins uh, and, and forces China to suffer even more humiliations. Not only are they losing battles and wars with Britain and France, but now they're losing to the Japanese. And uh, the negotiations that ended the First Sino-Japanese War uh, resulted in the Treaty of Shimonoseki, named after the Japanese city in which the negotiations took place in 1895. And among the provisions of this treaty, Taiwan was given to Japan as a spoil of war. And so from 1895 on, Taiwan has not been under the control of a mainland Chinese regime. And that's one of the significant reasons why it remains a very contested and disputed island even to this day. Interesting to note, uh, the Qing statesman that was charged with negotiating on behalf of China is this guy, Li Hongzhang. Uh, he was one of these provincial commanders that raised an army to put down the Taiping Rebellion. He was also a big advocate of self-strengthening reforms in China, trying to learn how to make Western weapons and railroads and so on. Uh, and he was sent by the Qing to, to represent them in, the, in these negotiations. And early on in the negotiations, uh, he was actually shot in the face by a young Japanese uh, nationalist. And uh, he didn't skip a beat. He didn't miss a single minute of the negotiations, even though he had a bullet lodged in his cheek. And many in Japan, even though they were reveled in their victory and, and the apparent superiority that that would confer upon Japan, had to offer at least a little bit of grudging respect for Li Hongzhang and his willingness to continue to negotiate despite considerable personal sacrifice and pain. And many argued that the Treaty of Shimonoseki was not quite as punitive on China as it might have been because of this event. Ten years later, Japan takes on another regional competing imperialist power, this time Russia, in the Russo-Japanese War. And just like the Sino-Japanese War, most outside observers expected a Asian power, much smaller, much newer to this game, to lose to the Russian bear. Uh, obviously, this was a battle between two Asian powers, Russia and Japan, 
But various European powers lined up behind one or the other. I love this German postcard about the Russo-Japanese War that clearly shows that Great Britain is backing Japan. Uh, Britain had signed an alliance with Japan in 1902 and sought to use Japan to battle its eternal foe, uh, Imperial Russia. And so I love this, again, this German depiction of the British uh, with a battleship uh, as, as a hat saying what all English say, yes, all right, because Japan is going to war with Russia. Much like the Sino-Japanese War, to the surprise of everyone, Japan won uh, many battles. Uh, some on land, but even more importantly, some battles on sea. And of these, the most significant was the Battle of Tsushima. Uh, that's the, that, those islands between Japan and Korea. Uh, and this battle took place in May of 1905. Why is this so kind of late in the game when the war broke out uh, the year before? That's because the Russian uh, Baltic Sea Fleet had to sail all the way around Africa. The British wouldn't let them use the Suez Canal. Remember, Britain and Japan are allies at this point. And so it took them a long, long time to get to Asia. And then when they get there, uh, the, the Russian admiral, for reasons not entirely clear, basically sailed his ships one by one through the Tsushima Strait. The Japanese were waiting for them, and they sunk a number of them and dispersed the rest. The world was shocked by this. A non-Western power for the first time has defeated a Western one. Now, it's not actually for the first time. Remember, for example, Cushing uh, kicking the Dutch out of, of Taiwan. But nonetheless, this is a significant watershed moment. And it was a clear sign that Japan had clearly risen in the ranks of modernizing powers. And many in Japan thought, now that we've defeated China, now that we've defeated Japan, we deserve to be the predominant power in Asia, the hegemon of Asia. And this would have huge impacts for, for the histories and the experiences of all three in the first half of the 20th century, which we'll talk more about in a week or two. One interesting little side note, uh, the Japanese admiral who commanded the Japanese fleet in the Battle of Tsushima is this guy, Togo Heihachiro. And uh, he declared after his success here, I am firmly convinced that I am the reincarnation of Horatio Nelson. Uh, Nelson, of course, was one a, a storied British admiral uh, who won a number of significant battles uh, against the French and others. But it's interesting that, that Togo went on to say, it may be proper to compare me with Nelson, but not with Korea's Lee Sun Shin, for he has no equal. And so even, even the you know, Japanese admiral at the height of his success recognized the significant role played by Yusun Shin in the First Great East Asian War or the Hideyoshi invasions of the late 16th century, 1592 to 1598. A couple of other quick things. Uh, hopefully you did the readings about Fukuzawa Yukichi, a really important and influential Japanese reformer, uh, the intellectual father of a lot of these Meiji era uh, reforms and changes. And uh, he was one that uh, clearly advocated for following the West. If we invoke the alien invasion scenario, he's one who said, I didn't realize what the Galactic Order really was until now, but I need to learn about it so we can join it. And so here he declares, whatever happens in the country, whatever warfare harasses our land, we will never relinquish our hold on Western learning. As long as this school of our stands, Japan remains a civilized nation in the world. Fukuzawa was actually sent as one of the first Japanese delegations to visit the United States in 1860, and he learned a lot from that and subsequent uh, things where, where he clearly said the way to survive in this world, to prosper and thrive in this world, is again to follow the Western model, to emulate the West, and therefore we, we can become a wealthy, powerful nation, a prosperous nation with a strong military. Many, like Fukuzawa, saw then the way to become civilized and enlightened is to become Western. And so here's a Japanese cartoon of the time that nicely illustrates how this progression was supposed to work. On the far right, we have the unenlightened man, the uncivilized man. And how can we tell that he's unenlightened and uncivilized? Well, he's a traditional Japanese samurai. He has geta sandals, he's got his swords, his robes, his samurai haircut, He's not learned anything from the West. He's clinging to his old traditions. He is unenlightened. The man in the middle is semi-enlightened or half-enlightened. He still has kind of funny robes on, but he's starting to adopt some of the, some of the accoutrements of, of Western civilization. He's got an umbrella. He's got a Western-style hat. He's getting there, but he's not all the way there. But the man on the left, he is fully enlightened. 
He has a top hat, tails, walks with a cane, he has a dog. All of these things that the West does, so did the supposedly enlightened people of Meiji Japan. And indeed they did. Uh, it seems to be that many Meiji reformers thought, we're not sure exactly what it is, what's the secret sauce, the magic that makes the West so powerful, and so we've got to do it all. We've got to build with bricks, we've got to dance the waltz, we've got to eat beef, we've got to do anything the Westerners do, we've got to do it too. And the one really significant glaring exception is religion, uh, that the Meiji reformers did not, for the most part, advocate becoming Christian. Uh, but almost everything else, they, they copied the West, they emulated the West, and that is how you become enlightened. And for people like Fukuzawa, this would mean then that Japan needs to datsua, leave Asia or depart from Asia. Here's Fukuzawa. Our immediate policy, therefore, should be to lose no time in waiting for the enlightenment of our neighboring countries, like Korea and China, in order to join them in developing Asia, but rather to depart from their ranks and cast our lot with the civilized countries of the West. We should deal with them exactly as the Westerners do. And sadly for all involved, this is exactly what Japan does in the 20th century. Colonizing and conquering first Korea in 1910, and then Manchuria in 1931-32, and then making a bid to conquer all of East Asia, China, Southeast Asia, in the Second Sino-Japanese War of 1937, and then, of course, the Pacific War in 1941. And so much of Asia's history is greatly influenced by uh, Fukuzawa and others' determination for Japan to leave Asia and become even more like the West, especially if that may, means trying to conquer its enemies and its neighbors. But here's the flip side. Uh, here's a political cartoon that was produced in the West, and it's depicting a particular moment, 1902, when the greatest power on earth, Great Britain, signed an alliance with Japan. So in essence, the British man here is opening the door to the club of enlightened, civilized European powers and ushering his Japanese friend and ally in. And you look at the Japanese man being ushered in, and on the one hand, he has all the accoutrements you need to show that you're civilized. He has a top hat, he has an umbrella, he has tails. He seems to have figured it out. But are the European members of the club happy to receive him? Nope, they're not. And if you look, he still has his geta sandals, his traditional Japanese sandals. And I think, consciously or unconsciously, this cartoon nicely captures the dilemma that many people like Fukuzawa and other reformers in Japan hit up against. On the one hand, the Westerners told them, if you become civilized and enlightened, if you do all the things like we do, you can join the club. You can become one of us. But on the other hand, at the same time that the Westerners are saying this, the Westerners are also engaging in theories of scientific racism, which says that different groups of people, different races, are always separate, always different. And if you're not part of the white European race, you will never really be allowed to join the club. And many reformers, not only in Japan, but also in Korea and China, hit up against this. This strong yearning, this strong desire to join the club, to become modern and enlightened and civilized. But the feelings of frustration and betrayal, when time and time again, because they look different, because they therefore were of a different race, they weren't really allowed to be fully a member of the club. And this, too, is another one of the dynamics that will shape interactions between East Asia and the West in much of the 20th century, and one might argue even to today. But those will be topics of uh, later uh, lectures uh, when we get to get back together in the classroom.